Well, hello, hello. Welcome to Summit, everybody. How are we all feeling? Are we all silent? Are we all dead? Are we all asleep? What's wrong? Hello, say something. <laughs> Just kidding, sorry. Um, well, welcome to Sunday night. My name is Ashton and I serve here with uh, Young Adult Ministry at Crossline. And this is our Sunday evening service, um, like Sergio said. And I just wanna say a big warm wingapo. If you guys know what that's from, it's from Pocahontas, so. Or hello, we'll just say hello. Hi, how are you? What's going on? Um, <laughs> see, these are the jokes that I was talking about to my volunteer tier staff that were like, um, they just don't work. And then you just have to keep on rolling because then you just feel awkward with a microphone. But it's all good. I'm confident enough to continue on to the journey. Um, I have a few things for you guys to be in the know about before we jump into the rest of our service. When you first sat down, there's a couple of uh, cards on your seat. The first is a QR code. And so this is for all of our community groups. We launched our community groups a couple weeks ago and they have been awesome. And so if you are not in a group, um, I highly recommend joining one. We have groups for all different stages of your young adult life. So if you're in college, you're working professional, we have some um, more north, more south of Crossline. And so whatever fits your schedule or your stage of life, get it, get connected to a group. They really are such a lifesaver in a season where you kind of just feel isolated. Um, and then the other card is the connection card. And so if you are newer to our ministry, you want more information about who we are, if you want to serve, this is the best way to get connected to us. And so you can um, fill that out. There's a couple baskets in the back that you can drop them off to. Um, and this is just, again, the best way to get connected. If you want to know more about who we are or what Sunday night serving looks like, or if you want um, just direct contact about a community group, um, you can fill that out as well. Uh, the next is our uh, men's retreat, which is happening in October, October 9th through 11th. It's going to be an awesome um, weekend where all you guys um, can get together and just learn from an awesome pastor. His name is Ricky Jenkins, and he's going to bring a great word. They're going to have so many different competitions on the field and all these different things to make you feel like you're a winner in all areas of your life. Um, so it's going to be really fun. Um, I literally was asking, I'm like, wait, can I like sneak in to like go watch it? Because actually on Cross Science campus, usually they go up to Forest Home, but it's going to be here. Um, so uh, mark your calendars for the 9th and 11th. And a really generous and awesome donor actually uh, wanted to give some money specifically for the young adult men. And so if finances are an issue, or if you're like, I don't really know if I want to go, um, this should be a definite incentive for you to go. It's $95 regularly, but with um, just the help from an awesome um, person, a part of our church, if you type in the discount code YA, um, you will get half off. And so it'll only be $45 for the whole weekend. So it's going to be a really awesome experience for you guys. If you have more questions about it, want more information, you can talk to me or Pastor Taylor about it as well. It's all the information as well as is on our website. And so you can check that out um, at your convenience. So that's all I have for you guys with announcements. Um, I'm going to pray for our time together, for uh, the Lord just to really speak to us and um, just allow this time for uh, the Lord to just really um, touch our hearts and um, hear from him and be encouraged. So you guys pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for just who you are in this time that we have here together. God, I pray that um, you just speak through your word. Lord, I pray that each of us in this place, we can just be distraction free, Lord, whether um, we are coming in from a really awesome week or weekend or just a tired weekend or whatever it is, God, I pray that you meet us right here, right now with where we're at. I pray that you use Pastor Taylor and um, this message is encouraging and equipping and um, draws us closer to you, Lord. Um, I pray that you just bless each and every person in this room, Lord, and that you speak to us in a real clear way. It's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, like Ashton said, my name's Taylor. I'm the pastor for Young Adults and Outreach here. Really, really stoked to be with you guys this evening. Uh, I, I want to just point something out that chuckled, made me chuckle. Uh, Ashton earlier was asking, you know, for a little bit more of a response, and she said, are you, are you quiet? Are you dead? And it was like just the escalation from like quiet to death, and I just thought that was really amusing, you know, the, the nothing in between. You're either quiet or you're dead. Um, anyway, those are the things that pass my mind. Uh, we have been in a series that we've been calling Faith, 
Uh, and what we've been looking at um, for the last two weeks, now this is the third week, and then we'll have two more weeks after that, total of five weeks, is we're looking at this central call of life with Jesus, this, this uh, life of faith that is one of the primary things that the Bible outlines for us to do as we walk with Jesus. It's, it's one of the central callings of those who follow Jesus is to live by faith. And so we started week one where we've asked, we asked ourselves the questions, what even is faith to begin with? And so we saw that faith was actually something that everyone, regardless of whether or not you consider yourself a Christian or even religious, regardless of your story and your beliefs about the world, everyone has faith. Everyone has faith in something. We're all living for something. And so everyone's faith is something that everyone has, and scripture would tell us it's something that can only be fulfilled in Jesus. It's something that God himself was meant to fulfill. So our faith was meant to be in him. And then last week, we looked at why faith is important. And we saw this contrast between a life of trust or faith, to use the biblical word, and uh, mistrust. And we said that faith isn't uh, important just because it's like something God wants. And if we give something God wants, then maybe he'll give us things that we want. No, faith is actually what our souls need just period, faith in God himself, because fundamentally the thing that's gone wrong with humanity, the thing that's, if we're honest, wrong with our own souls, the reason why we frequently do things that we know we shouldn't do or we don't do things that we know we should do, the fundamental problem is mistrust in God, scripture tells us. But Jesus came that we would trust God. And he not only showed us how to trust God, he made the way for us. He is the way for us to trust in God. And so that is what we saw last week. And now we're going to continue on into week three, seeing that faith has an object. That the, the object of our faith, the one that we were meant to put our faith in, Scripture tells us, is God himself. Not just our preferences about God or things that we kind of make up about God, but God as he actually is, as he's actually revealed himself to be in his word. So we're going to be reading Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read the whole chapter. If you've got your own Bible, you can, uh, pull, that, uh, you can pull it out. Uh, if you've got a device you want to look, on, look uh, it up on, you can read it there. Also, we have it here on the screen. Like I said, we're reading the whole chapter, so we're getting like the fire hose of Bible right now, but you all showed up to church or you're watching this online, and so you knew what you were getting yourself into, so we're going to read it all together. I'm going to read out loud. You're going to read quietly to yourself, lest you come off like a weirdo to the person sitting next to you, and then we will pray and we will ask God to speak to us right here this evening uh, as we're sitting in our seats right now. So Genesis chapter 15 starting in verse 1, looking at the life of the central figure of Scripture, this man named Abram, and later Abraham. So Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside again and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And then in verse 6, one of the most important verses in all of the Bible, one of the most frequently quoted verses by the Bible, he says, And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, and here's things are going to about to get real weird, but bear with us because we're going to unpack it here in a second. So here we go. He said to me, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, and a partridge in a pear tree. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and he laid each half over against the other, and he did not cut the birds in half. But when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, 
Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted by, for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when the sun had gone down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephraim and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites, and the Mosquito Bites, and the Helotites. That is God's word for us this evening. It's written by a human author, but inspired by God himself, and so every time we open up God's word, he has something to say to us, and so let's talk to God right now and ask that he would speak. Would you guys pray with me? God, we love you. And uh, we pray that you would speak to us this evening. We thank you that you love every single person in this room who's watching us online. Every single one of us matter to you, and you love us each personally. God, we thank you that regardless of whatever our story is, whether we've been walking with Jesus for some time, or we've been walking with Jesus but really struggling to walk with Jesus, or we wouldn't consider ourselves a Christian at all, and we're just checking this Jesus stuff out, and maybe even someone dragged us here, and we're not even really sure why we're here. Whatever the case is, God, we pray that you would speak to every single one of us in a fresh way. Lord, we pray, God, as we always do, that you give us not just information for our heads, but transformation in our hearts. We pray that we would bring our full selves into the light with you because we know that Jesus has paid for every sin, past, present, and future. And so we can bring the good and the bad and the ugly into your presence, knowing that there's literally nothing that could ever happen or that we could ever do that would make you love us less if we're in Jesus. God, we pray that we would just know deep in our souls the love of God, and we pray that we'd be transformed in the process. Would you speak to us, I pray, and would you show us what it looks like to trust you and to treasure you? I ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are three quarters of the way into 2020 so far, and I don't think it's much of a stretch to say, woof. <laughs> It's been a lot. The last six months in particular have been, if we're honest, nothing if not exhausting. And it's been full of pressure. But one of the unexpected gifts of seasons of pressure, like the one we've been in over the last six months or so, is that seasons of pressure reveal the reliability of the things that we've been trusting in. And that's a gift because when we see that something that we've been trusting in actually isn't reliable, we can then go to trust something that is reliable. It's like a diagnosis for a sickness that there is a cure to. And so it is a gift that we should be in a season of pressure like this. It's like the video that came across my newsfeed from Kook Slam this last week on Instagram. It was this video of a bunch of guys who had been clearly cracking a few crispy boys, and they're getting into this, uh, to this like pontoon boat, this like paddle boat thing on this lake, and uh, they're like all piling in, and it looks like a perfectly like, I don't know if seaworthy is the right word for a paddle boat, but I'll use the word seaworthy uh, uh, boat. It looks perfect perfectly fine. And as the guys are getting in, it looks like it's going to hold them all until the last guy steps into the boat and you realize, oh, this is not going to go well at all. And as he gets on, the boat just like slowly starts to sink and take one on water. And the guys are all panicking and like spazzing out and like trying to get the water out, but it's just like slowly drifting out into the lake and slowly, painfully, slowly sinking in the water as they're helpless to do anything about it. And as they're scrambling to get the water out, they tip the boat over and it flips over. And the comedy gold of all of this, the just chef's kiss mwah, beauty of the whole thing is that the person that's edited this video has dubbed the theme song to Titanic over the whole thing. And so as it's just painfully, slowly drifting off the sea and shrinking, you've got like Celine Dion's voice in the background, like, near, far. And now you see why I don't lead worship. Uh, but like the, the point is, it's just beautiful. And 2020 has been very much like that. Not just because the boat is sinking and we all feel like, what the heck is the world anymore? But because the extra weight 
the pressure of the last guy revealed that the boat was not as reliable as they all thought it was. And the pressure of 2020 might be revealing to you, it certainly has been revealing to me that there have been places in my life where I've been looking for life, where I've been trusting to have the needs of my soul met that actually weren't reliable. Things that even though as I am someone who has gladly trusted Jesus with my life, there are little, these little pockets that I've been holding back or that I've forgotten the truth in where I've been looking for life in other things and, and building up an identity in things other than the love of God. And 2020 has revealed for me those things. And maybe it is for you too. The point is, whatever your story, all of us are looking for life in something. There's no such thing as just like generic faith. All of us have an object to our faith. And there's an object to our faith, not just in the meta big picture, but in every decision that we make. And so what an important time, regardless of your story, if you're a Christian and you have been for a long time or you're not a Christian at all, what an important time to evaluate the things that we're trusting in. What an important time to evaluate where we're looking for life. And so our passage in Genesis 15 is a nudge in that direction. This, this, this chapter that we just read, and again, I know there's a lot of things that are really, really weird and confusing, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I actually think it's incredibly beautiful once we understand it. But this passage of Genesis 15, it's actually two different episodes in Abram's life. Two different events that are kind of stitched together by the, the, or the writer of Genesis to show us uh, what God was trying to show Abraham in his life. Namely, that God is inviting Abraham and therefore inviting us to see that God himself is the true object of faith. That God himself, exactly as he's revealed himself to be, as he really is, he's the one that our hearts were made for, the one we were meant to trust in and hope in and look for life in, in every area of our lives and in every decision of our lives. Here's the backstory. So the book of Genesis begins in, in chapters 1 to 11 with a story of God and everything and everyone. It's like this meta, big picture look at these questions of life, of why are we here, and what was I made for, and what is the good life, and why is the world not the way that it was made to be? It's clearly not as it should be, and so why is that? And is there something wrong with the human heart? And if there is something that's gone wrong with the human heart, what is that? And so that, that's what the first 11 chapters of Genesis are exploring. It's God and everything and everyone. It's God in the whole world. And then there's a big shift that happens at chapter 12, where it goes from God in the whole world, and it's looking at all the, all the people of the world, to now it's focused on one family. And we meet this man named Abraham and his wife, then Abram and his wife, Sarai, later Sarah, and we learn about their family and what God is going to do through their family. What we learn is that God is going to begin this rescue project for the brokenness of the world, and he's going to do it through their family as he's inviting them to follow him. And, and he, he gives a call, God gives a call to Abram's life. And he says, through you, I'm going to make a great people. And through you, all the nations, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Because of what I'm going to do through you, Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to to be blessed. There's this rescue mission that God is beginning through Abraham. And there's this promise that comes with it. You're going to have an heir, even though you are way past the age of being able to have children. You and your wife are no longer biologically able to have children, but I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to make it happen. And I'm going to give you this land that you don't know where it is yet, and you're just going to have to follow me, and I'm going to show you, but I'm going to give you a land, and I'm going to give you a son. And so Abram is trusting God and going forward. And in the story right before chapter 15 that we just read, Abram has this big military victory. And at the tail end of this military victory, there's this king of a city named Salem, which later becomes Jerusalem, but it's not yet the Jerusalem that you might be thinking of. It's, it's totally different, but it's this, this king of Salem. And he comes to Abram and he offers Abram the spoils of war. Abram has a victory, and he basically offers Abram the loot from the war. 
And Abraham has a choice. Is he going to take the loot or is he not going to take the loot? And he knows that taking the loot is not how God wants to fulfill the promise. It would mean a lot of money. It would mean power. It would mean a footprint in the land that God had promised him. But he knows that's not how God wants to do it. God wants Abraham to trust God. And so he chooses not to take the deal. And then we get to Genesis 15. And Abram has all these questions. God, was I right to trust you? I mean, I just gave up a whole load of cash. Was I right to trust you? Are you going to deliver on what you said? Can you actually meet the needs of my soul? Will you actually do what you said you were going to do? And how can I know it if it's true? And in these two episodes, God brings his answers to Abraham. He brings his answers to show him, Abraham, I am the one your soul needs. I am the one that can deliver what you need. And I will do what I said I will do. And he shows him by teasing out two questions. This is how we'll spend the rest of our time. He teases out these two questions in the two episodes that we see here. The first question is this. Abraham, us, what is actually trustworthy? When it comes to what we would trust to meet the deepest needs of our souls, what is trustworthy? And secondly, what is worth treasuring? What is trustworthy and what is worth treasuring? And so we'll dive right in like our passage does by beginning with this question, when it comes to the deepest needs of our souls, what is trustworthy? See, in in verse 1, the Lord comes to Abram and he says, fear not, Abram, you've just made this costly decision, but don't be afraid. I am your shield. The money you could have gotten from the king of Salem isn't your shield. Trying to make the promise happen on your own terms, that's not your shield. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram's response, if we could paraphrase it, is basically like, cool, God, I got it, but how's this all going to happen? I don't even have a son. How is this all going to come about? And then God takes Abram through a little object lesson, and he brings him out uh, to the night sky. And in verse five, verses 5 and 6, it says this. He brought him outside, and he said, look toward the heavens and number the stars if you're able to number them. And God says to him, so shall your offspring be. And then a very famous verse, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So I just want to, to understand what God is doing here. I want to put ourselves in Abram's shoes. Uh, a- Abram, first of all, we're, we're, we're in the ancient world, and so there's no light pollution, there's no air pollution, and the, the, the stars that we can see, that, that he would have been able to see, are way more impressive and majestic than what we might be able to see if we were to look out into the you know, 2020 like apocalypse era with all the wild, wildfires right now. Like, um, that don't like isolate that and spread that somewhere that like Pastor Taylor says it's the apocalypse. Um, (laughs) I regret that immediately. Um, But imagine just the clarity and the majesty of the the stars with no light pollution. Like a a few years ago, uh, maybe six or seven years ago, uh, there was a a big meteor shower um, that was one of the biggest meteor showers of the last 10 or 15 years. And so uh, a friend of mine reaches out to me and, and says, hey, there's this big meteor shower. Like, let's go out to Joshua Tree and we're, we're, let's go see this meteor shower. And so a group of us, we drove out in the middle of the night and it was like two in the morning when the meteors finally came and we're all like falling asleep. And it's like, oh, someone's like, oh, the meteors, the meteors came. But out in the desert, uh, without light pollution and way, with lay, way less air pollution, this, the stars that you are able to see, it's an entirely different experience than looking up at the night sky here. It's majestic. There's a scale and a scope that you can't even really fully wrap your mind around just staring, looking up at the sky. And imagine it being that much more in the ancient world where there's no light pollution at all. And so God is taking Abram out under the night sky and saying, Abram, look up at the stars. I've got something to show you there. Now, there's a specific promise that God is making to Abram. The specific promise is, Abram, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars you can see. In other words, it's going to be more than you can count. But I think God is showing something, Abram, uh, something else as well. Because if if you notice, Abram's question wasn't, God, how many offspring will I have? And so God's like, oh, let me show you. Count. One, two, three, four. This is how many offspring you're going to have. Abram's question was not, how many offspring am I going to have? 
Abram's question was, God, how am I going to even have one son? Not how many will I have, how will I even have one? One And so in light of that question and in light of the God of the universe, the God that created the stars, showing Abram the stars and using that as the lesson, it's as if God is not only saying, I have a specific promise for you that you're going to have way more descendants than you can even count. He's also saying, here is the answer to your lingering doubt. I am the God who made the stars of the sky. I made a universe that is bigger in scope and scale than you can even imagine. It's more majestic than anything else that you can even conceive of your mind. I am the God who made the stars, who spoke, and the universe came into being. Am I not also able to meet the needs of your soul? And if we just think about the God that we're talking about here and the creation that he's putting on display, just think about what we're talking about when we're talking about this God and this creator. You know, if you were just to step back into science class, if you're no longer a student or if you're a student currently, think about like your astronomy 101 that you got to take for GE or whatever. But we are... Uh, a planet revolving around one star in our solar system. And so the, the, the center of our solar system, the, the, the sun, is many, 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 many times larger than planet Earth. But even our sun is just one star in an entire galaxy, the galaxy that we're in, the Milky Way galaxy. And so we, we, we should have a picture of it up here, the, the Milky Way galaxy that you can see with the, uh, from an unpolluted vantage point on Earth, the Milky Way galaxy, it's beautiful, it's majestic, and it's, it's, it's our, our star, the sun, is just one star in the galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, there are 100 billion stars, according to our best estimates. So think about how enormous the sun is and how powerful the sun is. And it's just one of 100 billion in the Milky Way galaxy. And now I want you to think about the fact that the Milky Way galaxy with its 100 billion stars is only one galaxy in an incredibly vast universe. Our, our best estimates right now are telling us that there are about 200 billion galaxies in the universe. 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy and 200 billion galaxies in the universe. According to our best measurements right now, the observable universe is something like 93 billion light years across, which means that if you could travel at the speed of light, you can't, but if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you 93 billion years to get across the universe. It's like that SpongeBob meme, like 93 billion years later, you know? Like, that's how long it would take to get across the universe. And honestly, it would actually probably take longer than that because we also know that the universe is constantly expanding. And so by the time you got to the edge of the universe, like, it would have gotten bigger. That's a whole other story for another time. I don't really fully understand it. Someone in here probably does who's, who's a physics major or something like that, and you can all educate us later. But the point is, we're talking about a scope and a scale that we can't even imagine. God is taking Abram under the night sky, showing him something so far beyond his comprehension and saying, Abram, will not the God who made 200 billion galaxies not also be able to meet the deepest needs of your soul? Will I not also be able to do what I said I would do? God is showing Abram and he's showing us he is the one who's trustworthy to meet the needs of our soul. He is the one who's made 200 billion galaxies meeting the needs of our soul. Ain't no thing for him. We could maybe think of the same line of thinking in other terms. Let's say we were doing a draft. We were managers of uh, some like professional sports teams, and uh, we were all. It was all. It was the draft that had come around. It was being broadcast on ESPN, and we all had our own teams. For some reason, it was like the world's most massive sports league, and it was crazy, and no one really understands because we don't even know what sport we're playing. But let's just imagine that we're drafting something to meet the deepest needs of our souls. 
and I, I come in, I'm a general manager, and uh, I, I get on uh, to ESPN, and I do, my, uh, I do my interview, and I say, yeah, you know, I rewatched Moneyball recently uh, with Brad Pitt about analytics-driven sports, and I talked to Daryl Morey, the, the general manager of the Houston Rockets. He's really into stats, and I got a bunch of statisticians together, and uh, I've created this advanced stat that is a perfect predictor for meeting the needs of your soul. It's called the GCI, the Galaxies Created Index. And so I pull it up and I say, you know, in fact, actually, I got the, uh, the GCI index right here, the rankings. I went to sportsreference.com and I pulled up the advanced analytics, the rankings. And uh, here's what it says. It says that every, uh, every draft prospect has a GCI of zero. No Galaxies Created. But one draft prospect has a GCI of 200 billion. Who are you taking if you got the first pick? You're taking the GCI of 200 billion because he's able to meet the deepest needs of our souls. Will not the God who made 200 billion galaxies not also be able to meet the needs of our souls and do what he said he would do? He's the trustworthy one. And so we have to ask in response, in 2020, in a life full of chaos where maybe we're seeing some stuff in our hearts that we didn't see before, we have to ask, what am I actually trusting to meet the deepest needs of my soul? And the decisions that I'm making in day-to-day -day life, what am I trusting in? Where am I looking for life? In these different areas of my life and the different relationships I have, the different arenas of my life, what am I trusting in? Because here's the thing about faith, the thing about trust. When we trust in something that's not trustworthy, it will always let us down eventually. And that's true when it comes to the deepest needs of our souls. Uh, an example that I, I've used here before, I think, but I think it's such a great example, is there was a journalist a number of years ago, and she was writing about uh, a group of friends of hers that were all in the entertainment industry. And they were all kind of coming up together and just kind of scrapping to make a living. Um, and a couple of them from that group of friends eventually finally made it. They got the roles they were hoping to, to get. They got the notoriety they were hoping to get. They got the paychecks they were hoping to get. They, they actually made it. They had struggled for a long time, and then they finally got what they were hoping for. And she writes about the experience, and she, here's what she said. She said, that giant thing that they were striving for, that fame thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, that was going to fill them with ha-ha happiness, had happened. And the next day they woke up, and they were still them. The disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. See, they had built this thing up in their mind. If I just get that thing, then all will be well in my soul. That's what I need. If I just land those roles, if I just get that part, if I just get that paycheck, if I just get that respect from my peers, then it will all be okay. And then it happened, and it wasn't what they thought it was and it drove them crazy. We could insert so many different examples of, of the same type of thing where we, something other than God, where we think it's gonna make everything okay in our souls. And so maybe it's not getting to that point in your career. Maybe it's that next stage in your life. If I just, once I graduate, then it will be all okay. Once I get married, then it will all be okay. Once I land this job, then it will all be okay. Or once we have kids, then it'll all be okay. Or what, whatever the thing is in that next stage, it'll all be okay. Or maybe it's not a stage of life thing for you. Maybe it's a lifestyle thing. It's, man, if I, just, if I can just get enough like, money and freedom to be able to do the things I want to do, then it will all be okay. Whatever it is, and all those things are great things. None of them are bad in and of themselves, but none of them were meant to carry the weight of our soul. So we have to ask, what have we been trusting in? Because God himself, as he actually is, as he's revealed himself to be in his word, he is the trustworthy one. But that's not where God stops with Abraham, Abram. He also teases out the second question in the weird part of the chapter. And that's this question of what is worth treasuring? See, it's not just enough to logically see that God is trustworthy, that God's the creator of 200 billion galaxies. And so logically, yes, he'll be able to meet the needs of my soul. It's not just enough to see that God is trustworthy logically. We also have to see that he's worth treasuring because at the end of the day, 
we trust whatever we treasure. We trust whatever we love most. And so it has to be more than just, in my head, I see that you are my creator and that I was made for you. And that's what God is teasing, is, teasing out in the second half of the chapter. See, God is, uh, God in this section, and, and as we were reading it earlier, you might have been like, okay, cool, like the night sky, and God made a promise, and Abraham had faith, I get it, I'm tracking, this is inspiring, and then it's like, and then there's these animals, and you're like, okay, that's weird, what's, what's he going to do with the animals, and then it's like, and he split them in half, and you're like, oh man, the Bible's got to be weird again, like, come on, oh, what, what is going on here, but, but this would not have been weird at all to Abraham. See, what the commentators and Bible scholars tell us is is what God is doing with Abraham here was he's setting up for him a ceremony that would have been well understood and and somewhat common in the ancient world that Abraham lived in. It's, It's what God is doing is God is making a covenant with Abraham. It's like a pact, a promise relationship. And so in this pact, both parties are making a commitment to be faithful to the other. And what the, the, uh, the rituals, the ceremony symbolizes is they split these animals in half. And normally the way the ritual would play out is both parties would walk together down this like corridor of carnage. And like, by the way, it's like, it's gross, but it's like kind of this funny scene. Like, it, like the writer of Genesis makes the detail of like Abraham, like shooing off the vultures, you know, it's just like, what is this scene? There's like animals in half and the vultures are coming and Abraham's like, get away. You know, it's like, it's weird. Anyway, so normally the way that it would play out is, is Abram would, Abram and, and God and, and whatever the two parties are, they would walk down this corridor together. And what they would be symbolizing is this. They basically be saying, we're going to be faithful to each other. We promise to be faithful to each other. And if either one of us breaks faith with the other, if we're unfaithful, if we go back on our word, if we don't hold trust, if we, if we don't do what we said we were going to do, then may it be to us as it's been to these animals. It's basically this object of, if I turn my back on you, if I backstab you, I invite justice upon me. Come get me. That's what the symbol is. And so if you put yourself in the shoes of an ancient person reading this who would, under, who would understand the meaning of the ceremony or think about Abraham, Abraham relaying back to his family and his friends what had happened with God that night and he's explaining what's going on and, and think of the drama of the story. Because if you think about the story I'm playing and what it means that both are on the hook, the meaning Abraham is on the hook, that God is making this promise covenant relationship with Abraham. But if Abraham disobeys as the story, as as it's going so far, that means that that it's lights out for Abraham. And And that should get us really, really worried because if we've been reading the story or if we know anything about Abram's life, if we know anything about our lives, it's that people break faith with God all the time. The life of Abraham up to this point, he's already mistrusted and disobeyed God at several key moments of his life. And so how could this possibly go well for Abram? If Abram is committing to this relationship where if he breaks faithfulness, it's lights out for him, how could this possibly end well? And the tension is left hanging on us, but here is what it says in Genesis 15, 12, and then zooming forward to 17. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then in 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. See, normally, both parties, both people, God and Abram, would have walked down the corridor together. But before Abram could even take a step, God puts him into a deep sleep. And as he's asleep, the fire passes through the pieces. And what commentators tell us is that all over the Bible, the symbol of fire is a symbol of the presence of God. The fire that went before the people of God as they were leaving slavery in Egypt, or the flames of fire that came when the Holy Spirit came upon the early church, or the fire that fell on the temple when the the presence of God came on the temple. It's God's presence going through the pieces as Abraham sleeps. And what God is telling to Abraham, what God's telling to us is this. I'm making a covenant with you. I'm making a pact of faithfulness with you. And it will be unconditional. And normally you'd be on the hook for your own faithfulness. 
but that's not how I operate, Abraham. That's not how I operate church followers of Jesus. God is saying, you won't pay the cost for your lack of faithfulness. Only I will pay the cost for any lack of faithfulness in this relationship. I alone bear the cost of this covenant, of this promise relationship. I relate to you unconditionally, and I pay the price. That's what God is saying to Abram. It's what he's saying to you and me. Just let's, let's think through the practical implications of relating to God that way. Because if we treasure something that doesn't treasure us back, in other words, if we treasure something that doesn't love us unconditionally, where it's a conditional, insecure type of relationship, it will always lead to anxious striving. You know, think about how common it is in, in dating relationships, especially early on, so common, where one person is more interested in the other person than the other person is interested in the first person, right? And so there's like some mutual interest, but one is definitely much more interested. And something that really commonly plays out, we all know, we've all seen it, we've already pro all probably done it ourselves to some degree, is when that happens, the person that's more interested and they begin to realize that the person that's less interested is only kind of maybe sort of interested and they, get to, and they begin to freak out, right? Because something's happening here, but it's like it's not all the way mutual yet, and so they go into like overdrive mode to try to make it happen and try to win the other person over, and they're anxiously striving to try to win the other person's affection. And so they, they're texting all the time. They want to FaceTime all the time. They want to hang out all the time, and it's like, hey, can we hang out? What are you doing? What are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you thinking? Here's chocolates. I love you. You're the best. You complete me in from the inside out, and it's like overdrive of affection and attention because, the, because there's an insecurity to the relationship. And sadly, it, it usually doesn't work. It usually actually drives the other person away because it's too much too soon. And while uh, we, can have, we can just acknowledge that, we can also say that it's really easy to sympathize with it because it comes from an inherent insecurity in the relationship. But God is not like that with us. That's not how God relates to us. God comes to us unconditional, with unconditional commitment and with a willingness to pay the cost himself. With God, the anxious striving is over. There's no insecurity in the relationship. We know exactly where he stands and he loves us even more than we love him. And here's where it gets real. Because thousands of years after Abram, one of Abram's descendants would show us what it means that God would pay the price for his relationship with us and for our relationship with him. Thousands of years after Abram, God the Son, the himself the creator of 200 billion galaxies, became one of us as Jesus of Nazareth. The creator of 200 billion galaxies entered into human history. He lived as one of us. He made himself small and vulnerable. He lived a life that none of us have ever lived, a life of perfect faithfulness to the Father, a life full of trust in God, a life of perfect obedience. And then rather than just reaping all the benefits of that obedience, Jesus paid the price in our place. He died in our place to, in payment of our sin, bearing the penalty of our sin. In Jesus, we see how far God would go to pay the price of his covenant with us. He would bear the cost. And then he would rise in victory over sin and death and the powers of darkness. And when we see Jesus, it changes everything. Because when we see Jesus, we see a God who would so love us that he would bear the cost himself. And that is a God worth treasuring. Not just logically seeing that he's trustworthy, but treasuring in our hearts as the one that our souls were made for. As the true object of our faith. And so tonight, or if you're watching this online, whenever you're watching this, we have some business to do with God, to reflect, what is it going to mean for me to trust and to treasure God in every area of my life?
for those of us that are Christians, it's time to reflect and say, is there, even though in the big picture I've trusted God, and yes, of course, I believe that God is the one who meets the needs of my soul, but are there areas of my heart that I've been holding back from him? Are there decisions that I've been making that aren't motivated by trust in him, but are trying to make it work on my own terms or my own way or, or according to my own wisdom rather than God's? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, the business to do with God for you is to cross the line to trust and to treasure God for the first time, to see that he's the one that completes the story, to see that he's the one that your heart was made for, and to see that what Jesus has done for you is the very thing that holds you back from him. It's to recognize that we were made for God, but each of us in our own way have turned our backs on God. It's what the Bible calls sin. We've disobeyed, but not just disobeyed in terms of breaking rules. It's, it's at a heart level we've turned away from God, and that separates us from him, but then we see what God has done for us in Jesus, that he pays the cost. And it's to come to him because of that and to ask for forgiveness and to let him be God in our lives, to trust and to treasure. And if that's you, I want to invite you to make that decision for the first time. And so right now for all of us as we do business with God, I just want out of respect for the moment for us to bow our heads and, and to close our eyes and, and to let each of us do business with God in our own way. And if, and if you either here in person or watching online need to make that decision to cross the line, to trust and to treasure, to enter into relationship with God for the first time, to have faith in Jesus, please do so. If you see right now the good news about Jesus and what he's done for us and it's compelling and you're thinking about God in new ways, this God who made 200 billion galaxies, but he's also a God who loves you personally and who's paid a cost to rescue you out of your sin. And if that seems beautiful in a way that you've never, that's never really clicked before, that's not just the high of a moment, that's God himself drawing you to him. And if you need to make that choice, just as a, a, a gesture of decision, I would just ask that you raise your hand right now where you're sitting. If any one of us needs to make that decision to trust Jesus for the first time, would you just raise your hand? And if you're online, this is a decision for you to make too, and I'll have some follow-through things for you in a moment, but if you need to trust Jesus, today is the day. Is there anyone else? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, if this is you, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. It's just talking to God, and the words aren't magic. This isn't Harry Potter. I say that all the time. It's just an expression of your heart. And you can make my words your words. It's just this posture of decision making, but uh, you can just repeat after me to yourself as I pray aloud. A prayer could be something like this if you're deciding to follow Jesus. Say, God, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you've always loved me. God, I've sinned. I have turned my back on you. And I haven't trusted you. Please forgive me. Jesus, thank you that you've paid for my sin. Thank you that you do forgive me. I give my life to you. Help me trust you. Help me treasure you. Would you come into my life and make me new? I choose to follow you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If that was you, the God who made 200 billion galaxies promises this. And I, he says this in, in one of the Psalms, that I've removed your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. He promises eternal life. He promises his spirit with you, empowering you and, and bringing the presence of God with you forever. Your eternal destiny changed. For the rest of us who maybe are processing through something different, we have some time just to let this sink in and ask God, what do you want to say to me personally? 
How do I need to trust and to treasure you more fully in my life and to reflect on who God is for you to see that he is the one worth trusting and he is the one worth treasuring. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna have a moment just for each to do business with God and let's let the silence sit and do some business with God and then we're gonna sing together as we close. Because when we sing, there's a moment where the stuff that we're talking about has a chance to go from our heads to our hearts. And as we sing as a community specifically, and we hear our brothers and our sisters praising Jesus, it makes it all the more real to us. And so in a moment, we're gonna sing our faces off. But for now, business with God, would you guys pray with me right here as we close our time in the word? God, we love you. And you are the one that we were made to trust. You are the trustworthy one. And you are the one who is worth treasuring. No one loves us like you. No one loves us as unconditionally as you do. No one is willing to pay the cost like you've been willing to pay the cost. Would that give us such a secure identity? Knowing that we're loved by the creator of 200 billion galaxies. I pray right now that you'd continue to speak and to move. And I pray that in letting the love of God transform us and seep down into our souls, would it not only transform us personally, would it transform our community? Would we be a community that looks like the love of God? And from our community, would we shine the love of God out to the world around us, to our friends and our families and our neighbors and our coworkers? And I pray that internalizing all of this, the trustworthiness of our God and the treasure leadness, worthiness of us, whatever the word is, to, that that would seep out and shine out into the world around us. And I pray, God, that you would do all this as we see Jesus. I pray for this in Christ's name. Amen.